Erin Smith, and I'm a medical oncologist with the Johns Hopkins Women's Malignancies Program. We're really excited that you have been able to join us today for a part of our Survive and Thrive 2021 Lunch and Learn series, and we'd like to welcome you to the presentation. On behalf of myself and Dr. Verit Stearns and our entire planning committee, we would like to uh, welcome you and thank you for joining us. We've been hard at work putting together a series of Lunch and Learn webinars focused on survivorship and living well. Today's presentation uh, will be called Thriving in Summer, Steeping in Sunshine and Nature for Optimal Health. We will be hearing from Dr. Roseanne Scheinberg. We are thrilled to have her. Dr. Scheinberg is the Director of Integrative Medicine for Anesthesiology and Critical, Critical Care Medicine at Johns Hopkins. She's an Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine also. Dr. Scheinberg is uh, adored by many of our patients with breast cancer who receive care at Johns Hopkins and has played an integrate, a huge role in bringing integrative medicine to women living with metastatic disease as part of our growing clinic of uh, multidisciplinary care for women living with metastatic disease. We are also really excited to have here today uh, Jillian Lachoda, to who will be bringing the patient voice uh, to this webinar. Uh, Jillian is a breast cancer patient and also the founder and director of the I Rise Above Foundation, an organization supporting young women uh, after their breast cancer journey. Uh, Elissa Thorner will be moderating the webinar with me. Elissa is a patient advocate and has played an instrumental role in our breast cancer program at Johns Hopkins for years, playing many different roles, but really hugely important in developing our educational and outreach webinar uh, efforts. Just to let you know a little bit about how the webinar is going to go, we will start with a presentation by Dr. Scheinberg, and I will let her share her screen and her slides uh, in just a moment. We'll hear from her for about 30 minutes. After that, uh, we will turn it over to Jillian, who will be sharing her experiences as they relate to the topic of today's webinar uh, from the patient perspective. And then after that, there will be an open live question and answer session moderated by Elissa Thorner. Um, participants, we will be muting you due the, during the webinar, so you will not be able to ask your questions during the presentations. However, we would like you to type your questions into the chat box or the Q&A box. We will be monitoring it, and then we will review and select them and bring them up for discussion. Uh, if we are unable to get to your question during the session, uh, we will do our very best, but feel free to reach out to your providers. After the webinar, we will, be, we will be sending you an email with a link to complete an evaluation. We really ask you to complete this with seven days as it is hugely important to help us plan future programs and initiatives. And now we're ready to go on to Dr. Scheinberg's uh, presentation. Thanks so much, Dr. Smith. So while I get this up, is a lunch and learn. So I hope you're all lunching while you're here and then we can do a little sharing and um, learning together, I hope. Um, in honor of this topic, I tried to come to you from nature today since it's a, a virtual talk. I thought virtual nature would, um, would work just as well too. So um, yes, welcome and thanks for joining us today. And I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, and part of, you know, uh, touching base with this this patient population that you you all are so amazing and it's so different. You know, the the patients that I get to work with. I was up all night in the operating room doing a heart transplants as you know my other role in cardiac anesthesia. And today I'm not only excited to talk about sort of being outside and you know kind of the other aspects of health and wellness other than surgery. Um, I hope to get outside myself uh, a little bit after this, and I would encourage you to do the same thing. So just a, a little background a bit, again about what inspired this. Um, you know, when I do integrative medicine, time and time again, I will hear, you know, it's not fair that people go through cancer treatment um, without knowing how much their lifestyle choices impact their health. And so that's a message that um, I love to get out of there. 
And um, this quote by a, a physician who wrote his own book as he went through his own journey of brain cancer, um, Dr. Servin Schreiber, but I think the point is fair, you know, I view um, the work I do with our, our oncologists as um, very mutually beneficial. They are obviously focused and targeted on doing everything they can um, to target cancer and, you know, get rid of that and treat that. And then um, I, I like to think of myself as kind of focusing on everything else much like I do in the operating room. Surgeon is focused on what they're doing on the operation. I take care of the rest of the patient and their needs for that. So to me, these things do relate um, very well together. So where does health come from? You know, who is bestowing health? Who, there, you know, we all want the health fairy to come and bestow us with, um, you know, wonderful, resilient um, health with longevity in our genes um, and, and minimal blips along the way. But, you know, I find it very fascinating that, you know, despite sort of what we were trained in medical school, when we think about people's lifetime and overall health, look at that 15 to 20 percent comes from medical treatment. And I am not denying that that 15 to 20 percent is important, very critical at times. But your health, there's still a lot of it that comes from how we live our lives. So the social and economic impacts, clearly important. I like to also think about these behavioral and lifestyle impacts because those are things that we tend to have more control over, right? That whole left-hand swath and then a little piece of environment as well on the bottom. So that's a little bit more about what we're talking about today. Inflammation and cancer. So inflammation is something that I have been thinking about, talking about, writing about for, um, for, for several years now because it's more and more finding um, that kind of chronic low-grade inflammation, which results from how we live our lives, potentially, um, is, is influencing um, our patterns and our predilection to um, diseases. Not only cancer, but this is also related to um, the development of cardiovascular diseases and chronic pain and autoimmune issues as well. So we're finding this link, you know, is is um, is is important. Now, inflammation is not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's normal, right? They're number number three. It's the body's response to tissue damage. We need it, um, and it's when these responses. Um, don't have the normal feedback mechanisms to calm down after the, you know, initial um, correct response to some kind of tissue damage is when we start to see problems. And when we think about inflammation, you know, what triggers an inflammatory response? Well, an infection from bacteria, viruses, clearly, environmental pollutants, um, secondhand smoke is an example there. Um, every time you go to the gas station, you know, you smell that gas smell, that's benzene you're breathing in. And it's fascinating because a lot of the things that we're exposed to in our environment now, our body, our, our genes, our evolution hasn't yet evolved to come up with a way to really efficiently detox those things from our system. So we end up with a lot of these things over time accumulating and they can affect these inflammatory pathways and, um, you know, stop the normal regulation of tamping down the inflammation after it's done and needed and creating sort of a situation of chronic inflammation. I talk a lot about things on kind of that left-hand side of the screen, the stress you know, whether it's physiologic or mental, you know, we think about exercise, we think about sleep, food, huge um, potential for anti-inflammatory or inflammatory influence on the body as a whole. So, you know, this, nobody needs to panic with this slide. Um, if you're stressed, it does not mean that your cancer is going to come back. However, you know, there, there are different ways to wake sort of dormant cells. And um, in this study, this researcher was looking and one mechanism is, is um, stress. And, and stress is related to um, the body's response to stress is, is inflammation in, in some sense. So that is, you know, that, that link does come in there. So um, there's a lot of research that's shown that stress can cause sort of one of these factors that can assist it in spreading and growing in mice. Um, there, uh, there's not a clear link between stress and cancer outcomes, but it is something to think about as, again, one of these modifiable factors. And we'll talk about where nature comes into stress. So yes, we are working perhaps harder, not smarter, um, but, uh, 
uh, why are we, you know, we, we have, right? Modern life, we're really um, pressed to be better and work harder and do more um, for more people. And, um, you know, that last question at the bottom there, why can't we just take a break? <laughs> this is a lovely book that, you know, talks about the evolution of that. And it goes back, you know, from very early times, um, you know, even in the days when people were making the pyramids, they actually, even though people worked more seasonally back then, they had much more leisure time and downtime that we don't seem to allow ourselves nowadays. Okay, fair enough. Everything is easier said than done, <laughs> except for talking. That's about the same, right? <laughs> All right. I'm curious if anyone's ever heard this term, forest bathing. I hadn't until, you know, a few years ago. When I heard the first term, I went, well, who's taking a bath in the forest? That seems like an odd thing to do. <laughs> but what it is, is this is a term that um, comes out of uh, East Asia. And in, in 1982, the, the Japanese Ministry of Agriculture, Forest, Fishery, they instituted a national forest bathing program. And their, their purpose was actually twofold. They wanted to offer an antidote to sort of the um, all of the techno boom burnout that was happening in their country. They also wanted to inspire their residents to reconnect with nature and dual purpose, protect their country's forests. So that was their, that was their intent. And forest bathing, they call it Shinrin Yoku, is simply spending time outdoors under trees. And fascinating, you know, we, it's one of those common sense things that, you know, most people who, who spend time outdoors or in nature kind of go, yeah, I feel good when I'm out there. But lots of research shows that there is a wide range of health benefits. So your spidey sense is correct, including decreased stress, improved mood, a variety of mental health benefits, um, reduced fig fatigue, excuse me, and feelings of awe. I love that. Like who does not need more awe in their life? So when we, you know, people have been writing about um, painting, um, you know, expressing in different types of the um, expressive arts, uh, the experiences that nature has meant to them. And, um, you know, one quote by a German born writer, whoever has learned how to listen to trees no longer wants to be a tree. He wants to be nothing except what he is. That is home. That is happiness. And in the American poet, Mary Oliver, she says of trees, they give off such hints of gladness. I would almost say that they save me and daily. And thinking about my own trees, you know, I can even look out in my backyard and, um, Right now, they're being such generous hosts to our wave of cicadas that are coming, and uh, they're providing much needed, um, you know, places for these um, uh, these insects to to attach and nest and do what they need to do for their life cycle. So, have to have a little bit of gratitude for that as well. All right. So, looking at this forest bathing and what it has done or what it has shown in terms of health benefits. So in looking at, you know, there's a couple of studies that I put up there, but that first meta-analysis, it showed that salivary cortisol level. So cortisol is one of our big stress markers that you can measure in blood, that you can measure in saliva. Um, you know, poor medical students are always um, the target of lots of studies for stress, especially because it's well known that medical students, especially right before exams, are under, under stress. So there's a lot of studies using salivary cortisol um, um, samples from, um, from medical students. But in the forest bathing groups, they were, these cortisol levels were lower significantly before and after. And so it can, you know, in a rapid way, it was, you know, very quickly um, lowering these levels. So it can influence them in a short term. It doesn't mean that just because you go out to nature once and your cortisol levels are low, they're going to stay low forever. But it is a quick intervention to reduce um, that physiologic stress that your body uh, may, may experience. 
Um, and nature therapy, that second, you know, that second article, this review just talks about, you know, this, it's a potential universal health model. Um, and it's, you know, talking about um, that this could be a, a widely adopted antidote for modern day stress, and they call it techno stress, right? I love that word because who you know, hasn't experienced techno stress, right? In, in not, you know, not more than in this last year when we've all had to rely on technology to be connected with each other and to get things done, even like going to doctor's visits and things like that. So um, we are grateful for technology. Thank you, technology. It allows uh, me to be here with you today. So it's, um, I am grateful to have that in my life. But sometimes we all need a little bit of a break from it. Um, so here's another idea too that also comes from the um, the this this field of looking at the health benefits of being outside and being in nature, and this is actually touching nature. So um, this is another idea called grounding, and what it is is or, or earthing is the other name for it. Um, so we know that our body is filled with lots of ions, right? We're sort of electrically charged. That's how we measure things in the body. Our EKG to measure our heart rate and our heart rhythm is, is um, measuring some of these electrical signals um, as when we do EEGs to measure brain waves, same thing. So we have lots of um, ions and electric charges um, in, in our body. And we know, um, we have found that the Earth's electric charge, it has one as well, it seems to have some stabilizing effect on our physiology. Um, and, you know, there's, there's thoughts and research and talk out there that it um, can reduce inflammation, pain, stress, improve, improve blood flow, energy, sleep, and that, um, you know, it generates a state of more well-being than being disconnected and not having any contact. Um, and it's simply as walking around barefoot outdoors. Um, when you're in contact with conductive surfaces, whether it's grass or soil or gravel, sand even, stone. So um, yeah, so get outside barefoot today. That will be, um, that will be your assignment to touch something <laughs> with your hands, with your feet. Um, gardening. Um, you know, so garden without gloves, even if you have to clean under your nails after you're done, that's touching the earth. And there are sort of ion transfers that you can absorb um, that, that can be beneficial to your body in subtle ways, ways you may or may not recognize. So um, when I did my formal training in integrative medicine under Dr. Andrew Wiles' program at the University of Arizona, um, this is one of their tips on experiencing nature. Lighting room with bright natural light. Um, we know this is such a critical piece, and especially when I talk with a lot of um, oncology patients who are, um, you know, having a tough time with their treatment or, you know, going through chemo and need a lot of time indoors to kind of relax, restore, um, people sometimes stop getting exposure to sunlight, and that sunlight on the back of the eyeball, especially that early morning and afternoon sort of evening sunlight is really important to regulate the circadian rhythms. So if you stop getting that exposure to sunlight, um, sleep becomes really challenging and can be disrupted more easily. So spending time in nature settings, you know, whether it's gardens, parks, you know, just the wilderness, um, allowing some outside air and nature sounds to come in. You know, it's all a balance between, um, you know, clean air, um, especially in the summertime, air conditioning, you know, but the, the tighter and tighter we air seal our homes so that they're more efficient, right? So that we don't leak heat, we don't leak air conditioning. Um, the air can become, you know, less and there's less turnover of clean air. So some leaks are good. You know, we do want to get some natural airflow um, into our homes as well. Even in your home, displaying nature photography, nature art, that has also, watching nature on TV. I mean, who doesn't love David Attenborough? <laughs> he, in you know, at his time of life is probably the hardest working person. I've never seen more documentaries available on TV than I have in the last several years featuring his amazing voice um, talking about, about our nature, our world. 
um, listening to recorded sounds of nature. Um, so I think it's very soothing when I'm working on the computer. I, for me personally, I get a little distracted by music sometimes. And so nature sounds are the perfect background scape where it's, it's something to create a little um, ambiance, but it's not enough to distract my mind from what I'm doing. Um, yeah. And then plants as you're able to or allowed to indoors and um, animals. All right. This is one of my favorite things to do with people because um, <laughs> there's a lot of evidence that we don't breathe well, whether it's indoors or whether it's outdoors. So I think breathing is really critical because breathing, the way we breathe, talks directly to our nervous system, which is responsible for the stress response. Okay. So if we think about our involuntary nervous system, right? That's called the autonomic nervous system. It's made up of two parts. One part is the stress response. So that's our fight and flight, okay? The other part is the rest and digest. That's the calming part. We're meant to have both, right? It's like having gas and having the brakes, and they're meant to exist in balance. I will say, using one of the terms we learned earlier, techno stress. Um, modern world, the way we tend to live our lives in modern day now, we tend to not live in nice harmonious balance. A lot of the time we are skewed toward living chronically with a little bit of stress going on. Maybe we don't quite get enough sleep. Maybe we just have a lot going on, managing families, managing work, managing um, you know, parents, kids. There's a lot going on. Um, and so we tend to live like that. So the way our body is wired, if you're startled, if you're frightened, <gasps> you do short, shallow breathing. That's just how our body's wired. So when you take a slow, deep breath, it automatically triggers your nervous system to tell it you're safe. You can let your guard down. So it automatically, without you having to think yourself calm or do anything in particular, it signals your nervous system that all is well and your nervous system can relax and calm down and come back into balance. So I will invite you. I do this with every patient, probably honestly more for selfish reasons for myself because then I get to do it with them. So I'm going to get to do some deep breathing now and I invite you to do it with me. And this is one way to do it. I think there's no wrong way to do a slow, deep breath. And there are many ways that are out there taught in yoga um, and in various, you know, other settings. But one way um, is called a four, seven, eight breath. And what this is, is you inhale through your nose for a count of four. And this count is any pace you want. So it's yourself counting for yourself in your head. And so inhaling for a count of four through your nose holding for a count of seven, and exhaling through your mouth for a count of eight. So let's do three of those together, just so we can experience it all. So ready, exhale, get everything out, and inhale, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Again, inhale, and hold two, three, four, five, six, seven, and exhale. Last time, inhale two, three, four, and hold two, three, four, five, six, seven, and exhale. Great. Thanks for doing that with me if you, if you um, chose to do it. And I want you to just sit and ask yourself, how did that make you feel? Most people, it makes them feel better. And what I appreciate, Hopkins has been very involved at trying to lower the stress of all of us who work um, at Hopkins. And this, you'll see this, if you go through our, um, if you walk through our halls, sometimes on the screens, this will flash up. We've made a hospital-wide effort. Um, and some of the, we've um, even distributed some little cards um, that attach to the badge. Um, that we carry around that have this little graphic on it to remember to breathe throughout the day. Okay, now I just for a few minutes want to go on a little lighter topic because laughter, um, you know, besides being out in nature, besides um, experiencing the awe of nature, 
This is another natural phenomenon that we know is beneficial. Simple but true. Did you know there was something called laughter yoga? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many venues we have that do it locally, but um, yes, it definitely is something that um, can be done. Um, I couldn't agree with this more. Chocolate is the answer. Nobody cares what the question is. <laughs> In your mind, since you're all in your own environments, there's no one to judge you, what do you think? Statistics show that children laugh how many times a day? X times a day, and adults laugh X times a day. Just throw out numbers. Doesn't matter if you're totally close, you're totally wrong. <laughs> yeah, right? Children laugh 400 times a day, and adults four to 10 times a day. It's a big difference, right? When did we lose that, you know, that really childlike, carefree attitudes? You know, when did we grow up and um, forget to laugh throughout the day? George Carlin, I was taken to the hospital for observation. I stayed several days, didn't observe anything, and left. <laughs> All right. Little known illnesses. Did you know hypochondria is fear of not having correct change? less applicable during our pandemic times as we're all using credit cards and things, right? Afrophobia, fear of return of 1970s hairstyles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Deja flu, the feeling that you've had this cold before. Oreoporosis, a disorder caused by too many cookies and not enough milk. All right, I am no George Carlin. I totally get that. <laughs> but humor is important to all of us, however it speaks to us. Um, laughter is using facial muscles created by inhaling deeply and releasing air. So laughter is helping you get some good deep breathing and expanding your lungs, similar to relaxation breathing, the four, seven, eight that we just did. He, if nothing else, this is a great reason to laugh. You get credit for exercise. So... When you're a doctor, your next doctor asks you how much exercise you're doing. If you add laughter into your day, please feel free to count that as moderate exercise. <laughs> Stationary jogging. Don't you love that? You're being kind to your joints and you're still getting some of the effects of that. Muscles are more relaxed. It lowers your heart rate and blood pressure um, and it helps release some stress and pent up energy. Yeah. So it's the best medicine right? If we could only prescribe it in tablet form, I think that would, we would all be happy to do that. <laughs> so here's something. Genuine smiles. Genuine smiles are different than, um, you know, social smiles that we give to people when we're passing in the hallway or, you know, in, in situations where we feel we need to. But people in this, when they looked at this long time ago, women with Duchenne, these true smiles, were more likely to be married, stay married, and rate their lives as happier. And there's been actually different studies on this, but look at this picture. Can you tell who's, which one is the real smile, which isn't? Yeah, like they always say, it's in the eyes. Look at the eyes. You can see the eyes on the right side are smiling, um, are smiling with, you know, with him. And one on the left, he's probably just, you know, smiling at someone going by and, and it doesn't reach his eyes, right? It stops. So besides going and touching earth today, you get a smile assignment. Now, granted, this picture is a little creepy. It's got like the creepy eye smile. So I wouldn't, you know, you don't want to practice smiling like that at people because you, you might turn off um, friends and family. But think about smiling more on random days. Think about a happy time, something that makes you smile and then do it. And then notice, how does that affect you? If you do that experiment for one day, and you commit to just remembering some happy times and smiling about it, does that make you feel any different? Just notice. Yes. I love gratitude diaries. In fact, there's actually a fair bit of science. Um, a researcher down at Duke University named Brian Sexton, um, again, part of you know our, our Hopkins commitment to making sure our your physicians um, and staff here um, stay well and stay healthy. Um, our anesthesia department invited him to come give grand rounds and he talked about physician burnout. And one of his interventions that he had studied was a simple gratitude diary. I think he also developed an app as well now in the <laughs> techno days, right? But um, simply the act of at the end of the day, writing three good things that happened to you 
statistically significant difference in mood in you know some other quality of life outcome measures so it's a very simple thing that you can do at home at the end of your day and i love if you have like smaller children in your life because make this a routine with them um, and you not only will get the benefit yourself but now you're sharing this with someone who will bring this as a lifelong um, skill and it will improve their lives as well i love this so when they looked, they just did a study looking at baseball players and they looked at their pictures to see if they had that Duchenne smile or not. And those who did, this is a, um, a survival curve. So you can see, you know, um, at age zero, when people are born, everybody's alive. And then by age 100, all the way to the right of the graph on the bottom, pretty much everyone has died. But those, the, the ones who are surviving a little bit longer are those with Duchenne smiles. So yeah, think about that. If you're able to think about situations and create genuine smiles, um, yeah, they've made that association. I don't know if it will help you live longer, um, but, but maybe it has the capacity to. And I will leave you with this. Smiling is yoga for the mouth. So not only you get credit for exercise, but you get credit for yoga, even if it's only right here. Although it's going to be bigger, right? Because it's going to reach your eyes too. You're going to get that true Duchenne smile. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'd be happy to, um, yeah, we can participate. Oh, I think um, Jillian's speaking us. So let me stop. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation and it made me laugh and smile. Um, so we are gonna move on as you mentioned to hear uh, Jillian's experiences for a few minutes and then we'll uh, leave it open for questions and answers. So Jillian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I feel really honored to be part of this. And I also had big smiles listening to your presentation because I thought I was the only person I knew of that knew what forest bathing is. I used to travel to um, Japan on a regular basis in my former life before I started the I Rise Above Foundation. And uh, the, the group that I worked with there would often take us out to do activities. And one of the activities that uh, we experienced was this forest bathing. And I loved it. I think it was a lot of fun. Um, I grew up um, in a family where we did a lot of hiking and actually my dad always encouraged me to hug a tree that called out to me and hug it, put my ear to it and listen to what it's telling me. At the time, you know, I thought oh, this is kind of strange, but then it became a regular part of my life. And I now do this with my children um, and it's a really fun activity. Um, there's a number of things that really stuck out to me in your presentation and I, I really thank you for for talking about you know how important these other um, things that we can do to um, increase our improve our health and wellness other than just um, relying on western medicine to to help us recover from cancer. I think we have a lot of power um, to make healthy choices in our life so I really um, appreciated hearing your resiliency strategy. I think it's great. And, you know, your ending quote there by, um, and I always mess up his name, um, Fitch Nat Han, who uh, wrote a book that changed my life that talked about the, um, basically the essence of no mud, no lotus, and the human experience, and that sometimes we need to be in suffering in order to move forward to um, find happiness. So I I, I can completely relate to that. Um, you know, I'm after I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I um, I started the I Rise Above Foundation, which I now run. And everything we do is based on inspiration, empowerment, and support. And a big component of what we do is um, really focus on cultivating a healthy mindset, physical fitness, nutrition, and um, support from, you know, not only other young women who've been through breast cancer, but also people within your community who really will support you or, or the woman to move forward to, um, to be healthy. Um, and I, I think it's super important. A part of that that we really promote is getting out into nature. I think there's, which 
you've covered here, there's so many benefits to being in nature that, um, you know, really I th I've seen it, I've experienced it and that, you know, helps in the recovery, the healing process, and also, um, you know, moving forward to live well, um, being in nature. And, you know, I, I really do believe there's a, a quote that um, really stuck out for me when actually it was, I was in Italy. I spoke to Dr. Beard Stearns on the phone when I found out that I had metastatic breast cancer and I was looking at a magnet on the fridge that said, just when the caterpillar thought the world was over, it became a butterfly. And I think there's so much meaning in that. And I believe that, you know, women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, they have two choices in front of them. And one of those choices is they can be broken down and defeated by breast cancer, or they can be broken open and transformed. And I really strongly believe that ordinary women just like me can rise up stronger, uh, more powerful, more wiser, more in touch with their passion and purpose after breast cancer. Um, and because we get to choose the life, we, we really do get to choose the life that we want to live. And a big part of that for me has been um, getting out in nature and being active and um, experiencing the benefits that, uh, of that. Um, so I, I really appreciated everything you, you covered in this presentation, the, the positive effects of, you know, just being out in nature and experiencing um, the happiness that that brings forward. Um, I think that's great. And it's, uh, we offer with the I Rise Above Foundation, um, three different ways, programs, which we um, offer women to um, enjoy the outdoors. And that's our I Journey program. We have an I Rise and Shine wellness training program, which is online. And then um, we have restorative and adventure trips and retreats that are all outdoor based. So yeah, I, I think this is great. Thank you, Jillian. Really inspiring to hear your personal experiences and how you've been transformed and the amazing stuff that I Rise Above Foundation does. Um, I would like to encourage any of the participants to please type any questions or comments they have into the Q&A box or the chat function, but I'm going to turn it over to Alyssa now to get us started on the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith and Dr. Scheinberg and Jillian. Always great working with you. Uh, Jillian, I'm going to start with you. I, I've known you for a long time. I'm always in awe by your perseverance, your strength. I mean, I think that when I think of you, that's sort of the words that always come to mind. And um, I, I love the, what you were saying about when Dr. Stearns called you uh, and the man that you were looking at. I think that's a beautiful sentiment, the idea of um, we do, we can sort of take adversity and turn it into something beautiful and wonderful. And you really are such a, a testament of that. Um, when you started talking, Jillian, you mentioned about the idea of, you know, loving nature and hugging trees and, and sort of feeling and being outside and being present. And I think that really stuck, stuck with me. Um, because what a great time to sort of think about that after the year that we've all just had this idea of being in nature and sort of what Dr. Scheinberg was talking about was forest bathing. Um, you know, the idea of being in nature and being present and, and really sort of immersing yourself in that, I think, is, is really beautiful and sort of hearing the sound, especially with the cicadas coming out or getting outside. And I know in my own life, um, on days when things are tough, just being outside really makes a difference. Um, and I noticed, you know, I've had a lot of friends who have mentioned to me with their children um, being on screens all day, every day in these dark rooms, um, forcing them to get outside, how important that is. So, um, so I'm going to start with you with some questions that I had. Um, and one of them is, is sort of maybe not the most up question, but in some of your maybe more less up days, how do you sort of get up and persevere and get outside and sort of feel um, like being productive? Can you talk a little bit about what your experiences have been about how you stay motivated? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I start every day with um, a moment of gratitude. I think about the things I'm most thankful for in life. And I think um, you mentioned, Dr. Scheinberg, in your presentation, um, the importance of gratitude. I think it's really important to stop and, you know, take note of the beauty, benefits, and blessings around you. And, you know, not just having breast cancer, but for anybody to do that. I think it really 
helps you to stop and smell the roses and realize the things that, you know, though there may be some really crummy things in life, I mean, you know, it, it, there's all these other great things. And so as soon as you start to really like practice doing that, um, it almost becomes like second nature. I mean, I wouldn't be human if I didn't have my bad days. Of course I have my bad days. <laughs> but I think that really practicing that on a regular basis has been helpful for me. Um, also, I also start every single day with exercise, whether it's just going for a walk or cycling or doing some yoga or doing one of um, our program workouts. I think that that really, even if I don't want to do it, I have a, a behavioral um, uh, chart visible for me so that I've committed to doing these things. And so it helps me to stay, um, stay aligned and I feel all of those things, I don't know, they do something in my body. They help to cultivate that healthy mindset. But, and also the importance of breathing. I can't say enough about that. There's been so many times where I am I can feel like, you know, like I'll give you a good example. Um, it's always very nerve wracking when I have to go and get a scan or blood work, right? But I've managed to train myself somehow to just turn turn off going down that rabbit hole, breathe, and really just focus on the positives. And so that's been sort of my motivator. Like, I, I guess my fuel <laughs> moving me forward. Um, so yeah, I guess that's- What a great, um, I, I love what you're saying about how you get up every day and you sort of stay accountable even when things aren't tough. I often feel like the first steps, the first mile are always the hardest, right? Like once you get out and doing it, it's like, or 10, three tenths or whatever that expression is of the battle, just getting up, getting out there, right? And I have often told patients on days where it's tough, just walk to the mailbox, just get outside, get in nature, and just maybe the next day you can walk to the neighbor's mailbox, but sort of stay active. Uh, Julian, I love what you were saying about the importance of breath work and gratitude. Dr. Steinberg, I know you talked a lot about that in your talk, and I think those are really important things that want to circle back with. So the, the four, seven, eight breathing, what a great tool very tangible that we can do, as Julie mentioned, with scans, it's really important. I guess my question for you is, um, do you find, is there any maximum when you can do that? It, can you do it throughout the day when you have scans, but when you're sort of in traffic and holding your breath and realizing that you're not breathing as well as you should? And um, what are your recommendations with the breath? Great question, Alyssa. Yes, no, there is no maximum. You have to breathe anyway, right? <laughs> right, right, yeah. So no, well, there's, right? there's no maximum. I think doing it in traffic is a great time to do it. And in fact, I always do it when I get into my car. Um, so yes, it's a very good tool. In fact, when I work with patients and I practice the four, seven, eight, I say do three breaths, just three of those breaths every hour on the hour while you're awake. Okay. Not that you have to look at your, I mean, so the idea is that you get into this habit of doing it, just like Jillian, you were talking about, you have almost this behavioral contract. It's a practice. It's a pattern that you create with yourself. So if you start, you know, practicing doing slow, deep breathing, then when you need it, it's available to you. Your body kind of knows what, to, just how to do it. And it kind of just knows that it's going to kind of settle in and get into a relaxed state. I breathe with all my patients and their loved ones pre-COVID right before going back to the operating room. Isn't, who isn't nervous then? Mm -hmm. Jillian, that was a great, you know, uh, idea you threw out there of doing it before scans as you're going in. I think, um, you know, when you get nervous or you're stressed about something, it's two parts, right? There's the physiologic kind of stress. And I love the breathing because that physiologically taps that. But then there's the mental aspect, right? The ruminating, the like going down the negative pathways. We're great at that. And believe me, I was trained by the best warrior in the business. So, um, you know, what I then, may I give a suggestion for that part? Yeah, uh, Okay, so when I think about the mind part, so we got the body, we got some breath, breath work that can help calm, but to calm the th racing thoughts, there's a little exercise um, called heart lock-in. And how this works is, you know, the ultimate idea is that when we have a stressful and anxious and angry thought, 
the body responds, right? So it's not just isolated in our head. Our whole body chemistry responds for that fight and flight part. Remember that autonomic nervous system? So the, and there's a little bit of a lag. There's a tiny bit of a time lag between when we have the thoughts and when our body, when those adrenal glands are secreting that cortisol we talked about. If you can divert your mind onto a positive affect, gratitude, caring, compassion within that short amount of time. So the exercise, you have to practice this when you're cool, comma, collected so that it is, you are, you know, you can use it when you're in a stress situation. But what you do is you just stop, you tune in. So you just notice your breath, just notice your breath going in and out. You don't have to change it any. Then you can imagine if you want, imagine the breath going in and out of your heart area. Okay. Then this third step. So for 60 seconds, a micro intervention here, just 60 seconds, what you're going to do is you're going to focus on one of those positive feelings, compassion, caring, gratitude. So think of the last time you felt one of those, last time you snuggled a fluffy little puppy, or, you know, last time someone called you out of the blue that you hadn't talked to in so long, and oh, it felt so good to reconnect with them, and you remembered why they were so important in your life. So think about that, feel that for 60 seconds. Feel how that feels, that caring, that compassion, and then drop it. But practice that in little bits. It's a short intervention, right? You just stop, you tune in, and you get focused. So you're good at kind of zooming in on one of those good feelings. So when you start to get going down that pathway of, oh, I'm getting stressed, I'm getting anxious, I'm starting to think about all the what ifs and what does this mean, you're going to interrupt that. And you're going to say stop, and you're going to do this exercise for 60 seconds. Now, the idea is that we're not pretending the world is Pollyanna-ish and problems don't exist. The idea is that we're going to interrupt that thought pattern that we were just having, get into a better physiologic mental state. Then you can go back to whatever was bothering you, possibly with new resources to approach it in a less, um, in a less uh, uh, response, you know, in a less like um, stressed out way. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Um, and I was thinking as you were talking, I've, I've spoken with a lot of patients over the years who have mentioned one of the hardest times is at night. So either before going to bed and sort of that racing thoughts or waking up in the middle of the night. And I know when I was in treatment, maybe I've said this to you before, my hardest time was three o'clock in the morning when the world was quiet and I could actually sort of feel the feelings. Um, so yeah, I think the idea is of finding things that you feel grateful for that sort of make you feel good is such a helpful thing rather than thinking about all the things you either are worried about or feel sad about. Um, which I guess brings me to my next question. Uh, the, the breathing and sort of the visual imagery I think is really helpful. You mentioned this idea of thinking of things that you're grateful for. So actually writing down gratitude. And my question for you is, is it the type of thing that you can think about before you go to bed or do you really feel like sort of adding pen to paper and writing out enumerating three things every day that you feel grateful is really beneficial. Well, it, it's funny you ask that, um, Alyssa, because when Brian Sexton was presenting this work that he did with his gratitude, there was something about writing it down. The okay. translation of actually thinking about it, but then doing some physical act with it. So um, yeah, there was something about physically writing it down. Um, yeah. And I think that could be interpreted in many ways. You could do, you know, it could be writing it down. There could be, you know, you could do like people do vision boards. So, I mean, I think there's different creative ways that you could get really innovative and do something with that. Sure. It's interesting, as you say, that I, it's definitely something that I have employed in my own life is trying to find things that I'm grateful for every day. And when I have actually taken the time to write things down, it's also really helpful to look back over time and see wow, that was a time I was really sad, but I'm not that sad anymore. Or things were really good back then. And I know things are going to get better to being good right now today. They just don't feel great. So it is a great way to sort of chronicle it, if you will, um, and realize that there are lots of things to be grateful for in your life. Um, Jillian, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some of the integrated medicine practices that you've employed in your own life. Uh, I know that you've been such you know, a supporter of our program. Can you talk a little bit about some things that have sort of helped you stay grounded uh, regarding integrative medicine throughout your journey? Um, yeah, so for me, um, physical fitness is a big part of my life. Yeah. Um, and I hike quite a bit. So that I really enjoy hiking, getting out in nature and getting into my own thoughts, just di disconnecting from the world. Um, I think it's really important. I, I, I'm not sure what you called it. You turn off tech. Did you have a technology reference in your presentation? Did you have like, a name for that? 
Techno. I, I, like we just talked about techno stress. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I think so, we all yeah. that, right? Just, just disconnecting. I think that's really important. Um, so, you know, so there's the, the physical fitness aspect of things. Um, I really enjoy yoga. That is really important part of my life. Um, and spending time during that yoga that's integrated with meditation is very helpful and soothing to me. Um, I found that eating well really reflects on how I physically feel. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I pretty much eat a plant-based diet. Um, I do eat fish, um, but I notice that if I'm having too many carbs, I start to feel gassy and inflamed. <laughs> so like, that's not a good feeling, right? Okay. And then it just, then I don't feel like exercising and so forth. So really paying attention to my diet is a big one. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, I mean, other than what I had mentioned in terms of the gratitude journal, I, I definitely think that you're more accountable and thoughtful when you write things down versus you're just like, you know, saying them in your mind. I don't think you thoroughly, as thoroughly appreciate what you're grateful for as opposed to, you know, writing it down. And I do love going back and looking at what I wrote, like, you know, 270 days ago. <laughs> it's always interesting. Um, yeah, so, and I, and I do, you know, I, think, I also think it's really important to connect, connect with others. And so it's been very healing for me um, over the last four years with the foundation and connecting with other young women who want something different. They don't want to be, you know, uh, they don't want to be, you know, put in the category as um, a survivor because they see themselves more as, you know, I want to move forward and I want to thrive and I want to enjoy life and I don't want to be stuck in this sort of victim box. Um, I've really enjoyed that. And so that, you know, we have these trips where we go hiking or we get together and we, we do some cycling and so forth. And that has been really important for me because my friends who have not been through breast cancer, they are really supportive and understanding but there's just something powerful that happens um, when a group of women who've been through breast cancer come together. It's like teary <laughs> and a lot of fun. And there's a lightness about it because we all, although every woman's journey is different, uh, we all understand that, you know, the fears associated with the diagnosis um, and the unique challenges that, that come along with that as a young woman, it's, they're just distinctly different. And so um, that has been very therapeutic and healing for me, for sure. You bring up a lot of really great things. And the idea, as you started when you were talking about um, the idea of disconnecting. I mean, I think, I, as, I, as I said, I, when I think of you, I often think of, you know, sort of you embody mind, body, spirit of this integrative medicine um, philosophy, if you will. But, uh, you know, one thing that you talked about was the idea of disconnecting. And, and I have noticed, um, I feel more tense, as co more connected as I am to the idea of getting out in nature. You know, I have this Apple watch and it dings at me if I don't stand every hour. And it, like, it's like constantly feeling connected, right? Um, and to the idea of sort of getting off the grid is to me, I think, as you mentioned, something that can be very therapeutic and gets back to this idea of a forest bathing, which Rosie was talking about. My question for you, switching gears to Rosie, the idea of forest bathing, is there a method, is there a way to do it, or is it just the idea of sort of getting in nature and being present? And, and to follow up with that, is there something that you would recommend to someone who may be living in the city and doesn't have the luxury of really getting deep into the woods? Yeah, no, great question. It is no more complicated than just finding a patch of nature and just being there. So yeah. And, you know, the other message that I want to get across is, you know, especially about, you know, when I talked about laughter and things is allow yourself to play and be silly. Like, that's okay, too. Like, just, you know, give yourself permission for that. So go out and play. Maybe you used to make the, you know, knit little things in the forest with the little flowers when you were a girl. Like, you know, just skip rocks on... Now, the, the other question is a great one about people who are in urban environments and don't, you know, necessarily have access to that. So the other thing I will say is, you know, create a naturescape in your house. 
find a beautiful piece, you know, find even just a beautiful screensaver for your computer. So every time you look over and it's off, you're seeing a beautiful nature scape. Mm -hmm. um, like we talked about maybe just having nature sounds in the background, maybe Alexa can play them for you um, while you're cooking a meal or while you're on the phone with someone. So it's just the backdrop to what you have. Um, uh, yeah, and you can bring nature into your house. If you find a lovely rock or you went on a trip and you had a shell or, you know, a really sculptural piece of wood and you can put that in your house again, just to remind you. And then that you can go there in your mind, even if you can't go there physically. Oh, great suggestions. I love the idea of sort of embracing it in every which way, even when you're looking at technology or when you're, you know, putting a piece of art above the TV. So even when you're looking at the TV, you can sort of be with the nature, even if you're not there right now. We're almost out of time, but I have one question for both of you. And um, Julian, we'll start with you. We had a question in the chat about someone who um, is trying to incorporate different practices of integrative medicine in her life, but is getting some pushback from her family. Uh, and I think you know, most of us on this talk are definitely believers and we see the benefits. Rosie, you showed a lot of great data to suggest how important it is. But could you both maybe talk a little bit about tips you would suggest to a patient who is wanting to employ some of these things but maybe getting some pushback from her family? So let's start with you. Hmm, that's a tough one um, because we all thrive more when we're supported. Um, and so... I think that it's, oh, that's a, that's a real tough one to navigate. And the only experience I have that's close to that um, is, a, is a good friend who has been through this um, similar thing. I guess what I would say is that we always need to stay true to ourselves, you know, to who we are as authentic human beings. And I think that we really need to be able to have a clear vision of what we want for our future and, um, it, you know, when you have breast cancer, it's important. I, th I think that what happens a lot of times, you know, especially it happened to me when I was first diagnosed, I was in a really dark place for a good three weeks. Like, I mean, I've never been like this before in my life, but I needed to be there in that moment to feel it and not put a bandaid over it. And once I went through that experience, and I let it go. I was able to say, okay, the old me, I'm, it's not, it's not going to be like that anymore. So now what do I want? How do I want to transform for my future? I guess I would say to that person is that they really need to define, you know, maybe draw it out, draw it out on a paper, just like you would like on a, a gratitude book and write why they want to do those things and how it will make them feel good. Because it might be just like a communication breakdown between the loved one and the patient on why they're wanting to do these things. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, exercise, for example. There seems to be, you know, um, it, it, you have to dedicate an, uh, some time for you as a person and not feel bad about it when it's going to benefit you. And oftentimes, as, especially as women, as mothers, as caretakers for the home, we put at the last and we really need to be moving ourselves up in the chain. That whole idea of putting your own oxygen mask on first. We're almost out of time, but Rosie, I don't wanna um, not give you a moment to maybe say a few words if there's any kind of tips that you can suggest to someone who's sort of struggling with fighting her way with a family that's unsupportive. Just quickly, it makes me think of martial arts. Like this is something that I would, you almost wanna lean into it. There's something there to explore. Instead of putting up walls and boundaries and resistance, maybe explore, you know, there's something deeper. Explore why there's resistance there. So that would be another way to approach it. I think that's great. So I love the idea of leaning in and sort of not pushing against the resistance, but maybe softening a little bit and trying to explore it. So thank you both very much for all your wonderful answers and thank you for your questions at home. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Smith, who's gonna close us out. Thank you uh, so much, Alyssa, and uh, just a big thank you to Dr. Scheinberg and to Jillian and to the sponsors for our Lunch and Learn program, the Jane Rice Survivorship Program in Breast Cancer and the CDC. Um, also, oops, just wanted to go to our next slide is a reminder again from the beginning that we really, really want to hear from you. Please do complete the webinar evaluation. We want to know what kind of job we've done and most importantly, we will use it to plan future webinars. We want to make sure that we do things that are important to you and interesting to you.
and our next webinar is Friday, June 18. It's going to be a rather different topic. It will be uh, focusing on metastatic breast cancer updates of new treatments and things that are on the horizon. So we really hope that you'll be able to join us. Thank you so much for your attention. We hope you have a wonderful weekend and get out into nature. Thank you.